Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral medicine series. This video will be all about INR, bleeding, clotting, and all of the concepts that go along with those. So why is this important for us to discuss? Well, beyond being a big topic on the board exam, a lot of procedures in dentistry cause bleeding. And usually, that's not a problem. But in patients whose ability to control bleeding has been changed due to certain drugs or diseases, these same procedures could be potentially disastrous. So appropriate identification of these patients and appropriate management of them while in the dental chair will help mitigate those risks. So in this context, patients will fall somewhere on this spectrum between bleeding and clotting. If they're on blood thinners, they're gonna to tend toward bleeding, and if they're older, had a major surgery or hospitalization, are sedentary or immobile, they're going to tend toward clotting. So just keep this spectrum in mind throughout this video. Before we can get to INR, platelets, and all of that, first we need to talk about how clotting happens. So let's say you get cut, and the blood vessels in that area are also injured as a result. Now to prevent your blood from just spilling out uncontrollably, there are four phases of the hemostasis process. This means stopping blood. The first phase is vascular. This involves a vasoconstriction where the affected vessels physically contract. Next is the platelet phase, which involves a platelet plug where platelets rush to the area, and this is considered primary hemostasis. Next, the third phase is coagulation, which involves a fibrin clot. It's this mesh of fibrin material that basically holds the platelet plug together. This is considered secondary hemostasis. And then finally, we have the fibrinolytic phase. It involves plasmin, which is an enzyme in blood that cuts the fibrin mesh and dissolves the clot after it's done its job. So primary hemostasis is all about platelets. Secondary hemostasis is all about coagulation. Note that these are two entirely different things. So hemostasis as a whole relies on the proper function of blood vessels, platelets, and coagulation factors, all of which we'll talk more about. Bleeding disorders can be inherited via genetics or acquired via the environment. And there are hundreds of bleeding disorders that we could talk about, but of course that would take a really long time and it's just beyond the scope of the dental board exam. So I'm gonna focus on only the important ones. The vascular phase, as we just talked about, is our first step in hemostasis. So we will appropriately start with vascular wall defects. Thankfully, this is not a big deal for dental care, and patients with these defects rarely will have a severe bleeding episode after a tooth extraction. Marfan syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome affect connective tissue, which in turn affects the vascular wall. And then osler weber rendu syndrome, also known as hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, affects blood vessels more directly. So all three of these can compromise the integrity of the vascular wall, impacting that first phase of hemostasis. Management of these patients includes coordination with their hematologist, minimally invasive dentistry with good surgical technique, local hemostatic measures, which I'll talk more about in depth later in the video, and avoiding aspirin and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We'll talk more about those later as well. The platelet pathway is the next phase of hemostasis, so let's talk about that one next. So how this works is we have an endothelium layer that lines the inside of each blood vessel, and endothelial damage causes the release of von Willebrand factor, VWF for short from the endothelium, which then attaches to circulating platelets in purple via glycoprotein 1b. So at this stage, 
the platelets are now adhered to the endothelium via this glycoprotein and von Willebrand factor. So that's the first step, adhesion. Next comes activation. So binding to the von Willebrand factor really excites these platelets, and so they get activated and grow these extensions. Not only that, but they secrete activators that include thromboxane A2 and adenosine diphosphate, ADP, which further activate other circulating platelets, so it's this positive feedback loop effect. And now that the platelets are activated, they begin to express glycoprotein 2b slash 3a. Fibrinogen is also floating through the bloodstream and sticks to this glycoprotein complex like Velcro. And since Velcro is super sticky, the platelets begin sticking to each other, which is called aggregation. So keep in mind that as more and more platelets aggregate to each other, they also get activated, releasing more thromboxane A2 and ADP, and the positive feedback loop continues. Now I remember this step because aggregation, the word, has two of the same letters right next to each other to symbolize two platelets sticking to each other. The end result of primary hemostasis is a platelet plug composed of a whole bunch of platelets, fibrinogen, and tethered to the endothelium via von Willebrand factor. So that's how it's supposed to work, but how can it go wrong? Well, we have what's known as von Willebrand disease, which causes a deficiency in von Willebrand factor, affecting the ability of platelets to adhere to the vessel wall. Now it's the most common congenital bleeding disorder, affecting about 1% of the population. So without that lime green starburst here, that initial step of adhesion cannot happen. And we didn't talk about this, but von Willebrand factor also acts as a carrier for coagulation factor eight. We'll get more into coagulation a little bit later, but just keep that in the back of your head that this condition affects both platelets and coagulation. So we'll see it again real soon. And we also have thrombocytopenia. This refers to low platelets. It's not technically a diagnosis, but rather the result of another disease or etiology. It can be drug-induced, like drugs that are toxic to the bone marrow, or immune-mediated, so it could be related to leukemia or HIV, for example. So a normal platelet count is somewhere between 150,000 to 450,000 platelets per microliter of blood. Less than this is considered thrombocytopenia. You have increased clinical bleeding when that's below 50,000, and then you can have spontaneous bleeding once that number hits below 20,000. And this is an example of what a platelet looks like compared to a bunch of red blood cells. The platelet pathway can also be disrupted on purpose. So patients may be treated with antiplatelet medications if they had a history of heart attack or placement of a coronary artery stent in order to prevent formation of unwanted platelet plugs. So these medications are designed to interfere with one of those three A's, adhesion, activation, or aggregation. So aspirin inhibits the COX-1 enzyme to prevent synthesis of thromboxane A2 in order to block activation, and this is irreversible. Now other NSAIDs, like ibuprofen, do the same thing but are reversible. Clopidogrel is a drug that competes with ADP at its receptor to block activation, and abciximab binds to the glycoprotein 2B3A complex to block aggregation. I remember this one because A and B are right next to each other in the drug name, and so are B and A in this glycoprotein complex. So these are three examples of drugs that can disrupt the platelet pathway.
And then we come to platelet testing. So why is this done? Well, a hematologist may want to run one of these tests in order to diagnose von Willebrand disease or to check the status of thrombocytopenia or maybe even to see how antiplatelet medications are working, to name some examples. And next, we have to ask, well, how do we test for something like platelet number, quantity, or platelet function, quality? Well, we can order a platelet count. That's where you have a blood sample taken, and as part of a complete blood count, the concentration of platelets in the blood sample is counted. So thrombocytopenia would be confirmed if platelets are low. Again, it tends to be common in HIV or leukemia patients. So this would of course be talking about quantity of platelets. An IV bleeding test involves making a cut in the patient's arm and then timing how long it takes for bleeding to stop. It has been used to screen for disorders of platelet function, like in the use of chronic NSAIDs, and platelet number, again, thrombocytopenia, so it can be used to test either quantity or quality. Unfortunately, it's rather unreliable and no longer used. The peripheral blood smear involves looking under a microscope to see whether the cells look morphologically normal or not. So this will tell you about platelet quality. The platelet aggregation test checks how well your platelets clump together to form that plug. And then the platelet function analyzer, the PFA100, is an instrument that measures platelet-dependent coagulation under flow conditions. So it's better than the bleeding test, but unfortunately, it's not sensitive enough to rule out mild bleeding disorders. So neither the bleeding test nor PFA100 are recommended as screening tests to be used by dentists. So patient considerations for platelet disorders are the same as they were for those vascular wall defects. And now we come to phase three of hemostasis, coagulation. So this is a table I put together for each coagulation factor in the coagulation cascade or pathway and where they're found in the body. We don't have time to talk through all of this, but you can always refer back to it later. I thought it might be helpful to just have all this information clearly laid out. And note that a vast majority of these coagulation factors are synthesized in the liver. So here I have listed the factors involved by number. So how this works is each factor activates the factor below it. So for example, 12 would make 11, factor 11, turn into factor 11A, A for activated. And 11A would in turn make 9 turn into 9A, and so on. So you'd go down the cascade in that fashion. I don't have the A's listed because it just makes things way more complicated and busy than they have to be. So let's actually start at the bottom or the end of this coagulation cascade. So the clot is obviously the goal here, and factor one is at the end of this cascade. And it's aptly named because it is number one. It's the most important factor of this pathway. If you go back to our table, one, is fibrinogen. And fibrinogen may sound familiar. Well, that's because fibrinogen is also in the platelet pathway. It was the Velcro responsible for aggregation of platelets to each other. So you may be wondering, how does the body know where to activate this coagulation cascade? The answer is at the giant plug of platelets coated in a mesh of fibrinogen the substrate for this entire cascade. And this is why our blood isn't just one giant clot. It only clots where we already have a platelet plug. Very, very cool. So we have two separate pathways to start. We have intrinsic in red and extrinsic in green that converge on the common pathway in blue, which is shared between the two. And lastly, for memory's sake, 
factor 10, or the Roman numeral X, is in the central location of all of these pathways because, of course, if you've ever looked for buried treasure, X marks the spot. So let's start with the extrinsic pathway. This is outside the blood vessel. It's triggered by external trauma that causes blood to escape its vessel, and the damaged endothelium expresses tissue factor or thromboplastin. That's just another name for factor three, which jumpstarts this pathway. It's usually quicker than the intrinsic pathway, as a side note. So three activates seven, which activates 10. And now we're back in the common pathway. So 10 works with five to activate factor two, which activates factor one and 13. You can remember this because one is the smallest and 13 is the largest number. So those two work together. Now we've talked at length about factor one, but now let's spend some time on factor two because, well, it's the second most important factor in this list. It's called prothrombin. And when activated to factor two A, it becomes thrombin, which activates a bunch of other factors. It actually activates five and seven and eight, 11, and even 13. Providing a positive feedback loop and even activating the intrinsic pathway up here. So when factor two gets involved, it's really speeding everything up. Now let's talk about the intrinsic pathway. This is inside the blood vessel. And you may be wondering, well, what's the deal with factor 12, also called Hagman factor? It's not one of the ones activated by thrombin. Remember, thrombin only reached up to factor 11. So what is factor 12 doing way up here? And how does it get activated initially? Well, trauma can expose collagen on the inside of blood vessels, which activates factor 12. But it's not actually necessary for clotting to occur because again, thrombin can start this pathway from factor 11 and then it goes from there. What's nice is there is some order to this pathway. We start with 12, then go to 11. We skip 10 and go down to nine, which is next to eight, and it lines up with seven over here. So there's some order in terms of counting down with numbers right next to each other. But of course, like with the platelet pathway, things can go wrong with the coagulation cascade. So let's talk about some clotting factor defects. So for inherited defects, we have, once again, as promised, von Willebrand disease. So remember, as I mentioned before, von Willebrand disease not only messes up platelets, but it also interferes with factor eight. So we have it on this slide as well. Next, we have to talk about another big disease, hemophilia, which comes from the Greek meaning love to bleed. Now these people have a hereditary condition where they bleed easily because they are deficient in a certain clotting factor. Hemophilia A is by far the most common of the three hemophilias here, and it's autosomal X-linked recessive, therefore affecting mainly males. Also, if local anesthesia is necessary for a patient with hemophilia A, there is an 80% chance that a patient with hemophilia A will develop a hematoma following an inferior alveolar nerve block injection without prior factor VIII infusion. The hematoma could even be fatal if it accumulates in the mediastinum and compromises the airway. So bottom line, stick with local infiltrations only in the mandible for these patients. So hemophilia A involves a deficiency in factor VIII, A for VIII, and then hemophilia B involves a deficiency in factor IX, hemophilia C involves a deficiency in factor XI. And these two, you can remember, go together, calling 911. So that's how I remember those. Also notice how all forms of hemophilia affect the intrinsic pathway. We have eight, 
9, and 11, which are all right next to each other in that intrinsic pathway. So that can also help you remember those. And then to finish off this list, we have two acquired disease processes. So a vitamin K deficiency is the most common of all acquired coagulation disorders. Factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are made in the liver and require vitamin K for their synthesis. So that's why they're specifically impacted if vitamin K is low. Liver dysfunction, like severe liver disease, can lead to deficiencies again in these vitamin K dependent coagulation factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. I purposely listed some in number form and some in Roman numeral form because they can be listed in either form on the board exam. So just get used to seeing them in both ways. There are other disease processes that we can put on this list, like chronic kidney disease and autoimmune diseases, but these are the main ones that I wanted to cover that are most likely to appear on your board exam. Now, just like with the platelet pathway, we have medications that can disrupt the coagulation cascade on purpose. So if you have someone who is a clotter, and dangerously so, then one of these may be prescribed for that reason. Some examples include reducing the risk of heart attack or stroke, patients with atrial fibrillation, prosthetic heart valves, history of deep venous thrombosis blood clots, and things like that. Now the next point I want to make absolutely crystal clear. Anticoagulants are different from antiplatelet medications that we talked about before, because these drugs affect coagulation, not the platelet pathway. For example, a ton of people refer to aspirin as an anticoagulant, and that's not correct. Aspirin inhibits platelet activation by blocking COX-1 and thromboxane A2 synthesis. Now, while it is a blood thinner, Aspirin does not affect the coagulation cascade at all, and so it's not an anticoagulant. I threw out the category blood thinner, so both antiplatelets and anticoagulants are blood thinners. They make someone more likely to bleed. Now here are the anticoagulants. So warfarin blocks reduction recycling of vitamin K, which means that, once again, those factors that depend on vitamin K 2, 7, 9, and 10 are hindered, which will definitely mess with clotting. Heparin pulls thrombin and this thing called antithrombin together, which blocks factor 2 specifically. Apixaban, or Eliquis, directly inhibits factor 10A. And then Dabigatrin binds to thrombin, which is factor 2A, at its active site and inhibits it. So this is a direct thrombin inhibitor, while the other three examples are indirect thrombin inhibitors. Now like in the platelet section, there are tests that a hematologist can order to check on how this coagulation cascade is working. So let's talk about the activated partial thromboplastin time test first, or APTT. This measures the number of seconds it takes for a clot to form in a sample of blood after certain reagents are added to it. It's used to check the intrinsic system and common pathway. So it's also the best single screening test for coagulation disorders. It's used to test von Willebrand disease, hemophilia, among many others. The normal range for this test is somewhere between 25 and 35 seconds. A shorter time means they are more towards the clotting end of the spectrum. A longer time means they are closer to the bleeding end of the spectrum. And then we have the prothrombin time test, or PT test. This one also measures how long it takes for a clot to form in a blood sample, but it's used almost exclusively for patients on warfarin. 
and is used to derive the INR, which is the International Normalized Ratio for a particular patient. All INR is, is a normalized PT. It's normalized for different lab materials from lab to lab. And how to remember that they are for patients on warfarin is because the last three letters of the word warfarin are INR, just in a different order. So the normal range for this test is somewhere between 11 and 15 seconds. The smaller the INR that's indicating a clotter, the larger the INR that's indicating a bleeder. And just as an aside, the factors in red here are those vitamin K dependent factors that we talked about in this slide and this slide. So just to help you remember two, seven, nine, and 10, the nice thing is they're all right next to each other in that handy diagram. All right, the moment you've all been waiting for, let's dive more into INR. And this is a huge, huge part of the new board exam. So first, for all patients taking warfarin, there are some precautions that should be taken. We want to avoid aspirin and all other NSAIDs, which can make bleeding risk higher. And we know now that's by messing with platelets. So Tylenol with or without codeine is suggested for pain control instead. We want to avoid metronidazole, erythromycin, and broad spectrum antibiotics that can potentiate the anticoagulation effect of warfarin. Similarly, herbal supplements can make anticoagulation more significant as well, can enhance the bleeding for that patient. Barbiturates and steroids actually antagonize the action of warfarin, so those should be avoided in order to prevent the INR from getting too low toward the clotting side. For warfarin patients undergoing surgery, local hemostatic measures should be taken. So this is what I was mentioning earlier on in the video. And these involve compressive packing and dressing to physically stop bleeding, extra sutures and primary closure over the surgical site where possible, a 4.8% tranexamic acid mouthwash, which promotes clotting, and topical thrombin, which does the same. So clinical evidence suggests that the risk of bleeding out with a therapeutic INR is very, very small. In general, the risk of clotting outweighs the benefit. In other words, it's better to stay on those medications that favor the propensity to bleed rather than the propensity to clot without them, which can be life-threatening for certain patients. However, if a complex major oral surgery is planned where significant bleeding is likely, only then would modification of warfarin therapy with a medical consultation be potentially necessary. So where exactly do we make that threshold, you might be wondering. So for an INR between two and three, this is actually a great therapeutic range for many conditions like atrial fibrillation, deep venous thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism. Generally, there are no bleeding concerns for a patient in this range. And beyond the above considerations that we just talked about, you can proceed with any dental treatment. For an INR between three and 3.5, it may be desired for patients with a prosthetic heart valve, but it's a bit high for major complex surgeries. So if the patient is undergoing a simple minor oral surgery, like a single tooth extraction, you can continue with treatment with the above considerations. But if it's a major oral surgery, like a full arch extraction, then we wanna defer treatment and refer to their medical doctor about changing the warfarin dose temporarily, and then retesting INR before proceeding with dental care. Now, if the INR is greater than 3.5, no matter what is planned, the dentist should refer the patient to their doctor and request that the dosage be reduced to allow that INR to fall within a healthier therapeutic range. If the dose 
is reduced by the physician, it will take three to five days for the desired reduction to occur. The reduction should be confirmed by a new INR before the dental or surgical procedure, which should be scheduled within two days after that new INR. After the procedure is finished and there are no complications in terms of bleeding or infection, then the physician should be contacted to resume the usual warfarin dose. And at the end of the day, if you're ever unsure about any of these steps, consult with the patient's hematologist to ensure a safe tooth extraction. Lastly, oral manifestations of people with any of the above that we just talked about, vascular wall defects, platelet disorders, or coagulation issues. So what we can see is easy or spontaneous gingival bleeding, oral tissues like the soft palate, tongue, and buccal mucosa may show these little petechiae or maybe larger ecchymoses. Sometimes even you see jaundice, uh, pallor, and ulcers. And lastly, hemarthrosis of the TMJ. That's a bleeding into the jaw joint. This is a rare finding, but has been linked specifically to hemophilia. All right, so that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check me out on my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on them and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.